Hi guys and welcome to the new part of the channel. I'm going to call this one old movie, new movie and I'm going to do different genres. I'm going to talk about one old movie in that genre and one new movie in that genre. And first off I'm going to pick the genre I love most in the world and that is science fiction. So I'm going to do the new movie first because I like the old movie more than I like the new movie. That's not always the case but in this one I'm going to rant about a very recent science fiction film and explain why I'm ranting about it. That movie is Ad Astra. Ad Astra is a 2019 science fiction movie starring Brad Pitt and directed and co-written by James Gray. My problem with the movie is that it disrespects science fiction. I could probably need to go into my history with science fiction to explain why that's the case. Science fiction is the genre which is part of my culture. When I was a callow 21-year-old, um, I was quite damaged at the time, and the science fiction fan community allowed me to become part of it. So one of my cultural backgrounds, apart from white Australian, is science fiction community. So I've got a lot of love for science fiction. I've got a love for written science fiction, comics, and movies, and TV as well. Brad Pitt plays Roy McBride, an astronaut. His father, played by Tommy Lee Jones, was also an astronaut who disappeared on a trip to Neptune. The reason that Roy goes out there eventually is because there are enormous energy bursts coming from Neptune, which get stronger the closer they come to Earth, and they're starting to wreck a lot of infrastructure on Earth. We see the scene at the start where Roy's climbing up a great big antenna, which goes from the Earth out into space and is just purely there to pick up radio signals from other civilizations. Now, this is a stupid idea, and I'll briefly explain why, just to give you context on why the science in this movie is piss poor and ordinary. If you're going to build a tower from the Earth into orbit, the last thing you use it for is to pick up signals. What you use it for is to get people into space cheaply. You shoot them up an elevator, you shoot all of the stuff they need to survive up into an elevator and you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system. Any astro scientist who knows their shit will tell you that's a bad idea. So anyway, first off, Roy falls off the tower when this great big burst of energy goes through and basically has to parachute back to Earth. Really exciting scene. There are three exciting scenes in this movie, none of which particularly has to do with the story being told. So they decide they're going to try to find out what happened 12 years ago in Neptune's orbit because they're just waiting around for 12 years for some reason. And they go, oh, yeah, we lost a spaceship out near Neptune. Let's not bother with it until it actually threatens us. You know, we've lost a whole crew, people. We don't particularly care about what's happened to them until these energy bursts start. I'm not sure NASA or any space agency would work like that. So anyway, they send him to the moon first because... At the moon, he can get a rocket to Mars. Yeah, so they're basically taking the long way around with that. So on the way to the moon, they do a little bit of an homage to 2001 A Space Odyssey, another slow and turgid movie like this one. He gets to the moon, and to get from the city on the moon to the launching of the Mars rocket, they've got to go through some badlands where there are moon pirates in moon buggies um, taking shots at people. Now, there are a couple of things, problem, a couple of problems with that. First off, why didn't they just friggin' fly to the base, from the city to the base? Two, why didn't they make the base closer to the city? Three, why didn't somebody, with all of these governments going on, take out the bad guys? Because if there are people shooting at other people on the moon, somebody from orbit is just going to throw crowbars at them until they're dead. Doesn't happen, because this movie has no logic at all. Roy then heads off to Mars with a crew of people who, some of whom probably shouldn't be on spaceships anyway. And on the way, they stop to answer an SMS, SOS signal. An SMS signal, an SOS signal. Now, the problem with that is one, the way you go from one planet to another in space is you do a lot of acceleration, then you coast, then you do a lot of deceleration when you get to the other end, and then you land. Stopping halfway would use up all your fuel, if not more. But they stop halfway because there's an SOS on a spaceship, which is Norwegian, and which for some reason they packed full of angry baboons. 
Yeah, I kid you not. Angry <coughs> fucking baboons. It is a stupid idea. I mean, baboons are scary anyway. If you have a look at, say, oh, 1965, Sands of the Kalahari where Stuart Whitman fought a tribe of baboons barehanded. That's a good use of baboons. Putting them in a spaceship and going, oh, yeah, the Norwegians are doing some animal testing in space, so they put a whole bunch of really angry, omnivorous apes on their spaceship and the apes got loose and killed them. No, you wouldn't do that. Nobody in the frigging world would do that. Nobody off the world would do that. It's a dumb idea. So anyway, after the adventure there, Roy gets to Mars where they decide they're going to let him podcast to his dad if his dad's still alive. Yeah, they couldn't just get him to stay on Earth and send an MP3. They get him in a great big sound neutral room with baffles all over it to record audio for his daddy. And this is the core of the movie, the daddy issues. Roy McBride has daddy issues big time. He's, um, has, he's kind of locked down. He's emotionally distant. His heart beats very low. He doesn't engage with the world emotionally. And yet they let him become an astronaut because he has a low heart rate and he gets things done. So when he gets to Mars, he starts having feelings for the first time. And so they don't let him go on the trip from Mars to Neptune. But he decides he wants to go anyway. So what he does is he swims through an underground lake and climbs up this enormous pit, Brad Pitt, um, to, to get into the spaceship without telling anybody he's doing it. The people in the spaceship obviously freak out because they've got somebody in a spacesuit boarding their ship. Things get loose and everybody else on the spaceship dies. Roy then continues on and goes to the Neptune orbit where he encounters Tommy Lee Jones. So basically this movie is a mashup of Apocalypse Now or if you want to go to an earlier version of the story, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad and a movie with daddy issues. Now, according to IMDb, there are about 25,000 movies and TV series about father-son relationships. I think we've had that story before. And James Gray does a couple of really egregious things with this kind of ordinary story. He makes the movie slow and boring. You've got a space movie with space monkeys and space pirates which is visual valium. It really is slow and turgid with everybody acts like they're on valium except for two people. Natasha Lyonne, who plays a kind of customs person on Mars, who gives it a bit of vitality there. And the second one, arguably, is Donald Sutherland playing an old astronaut. Those two kind of don't make it sedate and slow and they say really ordinary things at a really slow pace. This movie shitted me for that. It really did cheese me off enormously. It, but that's not the core of my issue. If you're doing a science fiction movie, the movie has to have science in it. And you should get the science right. It's not hard to do. There are any number of consultants in Hollywood who are experts in their fields and are willing to look over a script and go, okay, you can't do that, but why don't you try this? Because it will make better science and it will strengthen your movie by giving it credibility. None of that shit happens in a science fiction movie. It's a bit like anachronisms in a Western, like having a jukebox in the middle of Rio Bravo. That's bad for a Western. People will pick that up immediately who know the Westerns and go, they didn't have world as a jukebox in Westerns. The equivalent is done in this movie. The science is egregiously and wantonly bad. And the second thing is making the movie so boring. Now, Brad Pitt is not bad in this movie. He's got a script. He's got a certain kind of character. He plays it well. He plays a kind of lockdown character who basically goes insane while on this journey to find his daddy. So, you know, all, all credit to Brad Pitt. Fine actor. He does nuance really well in this one. Here's my theory. And it's only a theory. James Gray did this because he wanted to make a Daddy Issues movie with Brad Pitt and he didn't want to make a science fiction movie at all. There is nothing in this movie that has to be a science fiction film. This movie is not one I want to watch again. 
It disrespects the genre I love, and it uses it to tell a really bloody ordinary story. Not for me at all. Now, I know YouTube videos are supposed to do upbeat stuff about new movies that come out because you will get the studios to like you, but this is a disrespectful movie for me, and it really doesn't add anything to the genre. It just annoyed the hell out of me. And there are a lot of people like that in the cinema as well. I saw it with a, maybe 50 people in the cinema. Some of them started fidgeting and talking to each other towards the end of the film. One guy had to explain why there wasn't more space monkeys, space apes, sorry, in the movie to his little kid. Not sure why he took the little kid there. Maybe the kid was in the space movies. Credit to the kid. That's the new movie. I'm going to get on to the old movie now, which is much better movie. Influential, state-of-the-art effects, just like Ad Astra had but it tells a good story and it has been iconic for well over 60 years now. And that movie is Forbidden Planet. 1956 starring Leslie Nielsen, Walter Pidgeon, and Francis and Earl Holliman. A good, solid science fiction movie. I even have the Blu-ray. Now, you should get this Blu-ray if you don't have it and you into physical media because... You also get another movie on it. You get the other movie Robbie the Robot starred in, The Invisible Boy, from a couple of years after Forbidden Planet. And that's a good movie too. I should really do a video about that at some stage. But anyway, going to put the prop down now. Forbidden Planet works. It's a big budget MGM movie at a time where big budget science fiction films weren't necessarily a thing. There are a whole bunch of black and white things that Universal was doing. Columbia Pictures was doing low budget science fiction movies. MGM was known more for doing big Technicolor musicals at the time. The production design on this film is beautiful. All of the sets are great. The costumes are great. The special effects are state-of-the-art for the time and don't look bad now either. You kind of accept that special effects aren't as sophisticated in 1956 as they are now, but these ones hold up well. You also get a lot of humour. You get Robbie the Robot in there. And best of all, the original source material, where Ad Astra had the source material of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Forbidden Planet went one better than that. The source material for Forbidden Planet was Shakespeare's play The Tempest. So William Shakespeare in a science fiction movie. What's not to love about that? The movie works. The soundtrack is a whole bunch of electronic tonalities by Lewis and B.B. Barron which already gives you a really interesting feel to the film. The acting is on point. There is a bit of stuff where the guys act like sailors on a Navy ship in 1945, but that we can kind of let that pass. The spaceship travels a whole year from Earth to the planet Altair 4, where a colony ship has crashed 20 years before. There's one survivor of the colony ship, a guy called Morbius, played by Walter Pigeon, who in some way has built himself a comfortable home, a good life, a robot servant, and he, his dead wife gave him a daughter, Altera, played by Anne Francis. She's the Miranda character from The Tempest, where Morbius is Prospero. For those of you who are Shakespeare wongs, Ariel, the sprite, is actually Robbie the Robot. But... The movie works well. We get a mystery in there. What happened to the other people in the colony? Why were they killed? How were they killed? By what were they killed? And we get slow, beautiful revelations about the planet itself. An alien species called the Krell previously lived on the planet. And they left an enormous amount of scientific gear there. A scientific base with an enormous power supply. 20 miles wide, 20 miles long and 20 miles deep, underneath the surface of the planet. If you think that sounds like a Star Trek episode, yeah, it does, because without Forbidden Planet, you wouldn't have had Star Trek. Forbidden Planet was the template upon which Star Trek was built. It really does give us the origins of this kind of science fiction storytelling. And it does a beautiful job of it. I love this movie. I think it's rich and beautiful to watch on a big screen. The transfer to Blu-ray is on point. And I watch it every few years, kind of just for the fun of it. Sit back with some popcorn and watch it. 
it works. It still works 60 odd years later. If you haven't seen Forbidden Planet, please see it. You're going to enjoy it, except the fact that it's a 1950s movie. Once you get past that, you'll be right. If you haven't seen it for a while, revisit it. I think you're going to be surprised at how well it holds up. Old science fiction movies aren't necessarily the best. There's some cheesy stuff out there from that particular era. But this is at the absolute top of the 1950s science fiction genre. It's such an influential film. It's such an entertaining film. It's got humour in it. It's got drama. It's got a monster, which when I was a kid, we found really, really creepy. In fact, it was so creepy that the Australian censors cut out any visual representation of the monster in this movie, which was ha-ha to them because it made it even scarier not seeing the monster at all when I first watched Forbidden Planet on TV screens. But this movie is a high recommendation from me. It really does show the best of the genre. And it shows the first time that a few things happened in cinema. It was the first time that a big Hollywood studio took science fiction seriously as a genre. And that's not to be underestimated. It's also the first time that a science fiction movie of any significance took us hundreds of years into the future in a positive way. It wasn't, you know, going back to a post-nuclear, holocaust, monster-ridden planet. This was a future that said, yes, we're going to get past the Cold War. We're going to get past mutual assured destruction. And we're going to the stars. So in essence, Forbidden Planet is an intensely optimistic movie, which Ad Astra is not because there are some plot details in Ad Astra which are very negative in their connotation. It's a science fiction movie in name only. So anyway, that's about it this time around. If you enjoyed the video, please like. Tell me what your favourite old and new science fiction films are. Next time I do this, I'm going to do a different genre. I'm going to kind of rotate through genres and do an old movie and a new movie in the genres, which is going to be a lot of fun. So thanks for watching. Please hit a like and subscribe if you want to like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon for notifications. Leave me a comment and tell me which science fiction old movie you like, which science fiction new movie you like and whether you disagree with me about Ad Astra. I'd be interested to have a discussion on what other people found useful in that film. So until then, take care of yourselves. I'm going to leave you with an image I took with my phone, which is what is called a noctilucent cloud. Now, this noctilucent cloud is a cloud that um, is gl glows after sunset because it's very high in the atmosphere and the sunlight is still hitting it even though it's dark down on the earth. Now, there's, that's one interesting thing. They don't happen very often. The second interesting thing about the noctilucent cloud I'm about to show you is it's actually a trail of debris from space junk that hit the Earth's atmosphere near my place. So it's a big kind of contrail of space debris which is catching the sunlight. And that's very on point for the theme of this particular video. Anyway, until next time, take care of yourselves. And I'll show you that beautiful image with no filter or no color adjustment of the sunset and the noctilucent cloud from the other night. Take care and I'll be back soon.